Chapter Six of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marzials. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The last number of Barnaby Rudge appeared in November 1841, and on the fourth of the following January, Dickens sailed with his wife for a six months' tour in the United States. What induced him to undertake this journey, more formidable then, of course, than now? Mainly, I think, that restless desire to see the world which is strong in a great many men, and was specially strong in Dickens. Ride as he might, and walk as he might, his abounding energies remained unsatisfied. In 1837 there had been trips to Belgium, Broadstairs, Brighton. In 1838 to Yorkshire, Broadstairs, North Wales, and a fairly long stay at Twickenham. In 1839, a similar stay at Petersham, where, as at Twickenham, frolic, gaiety, and athletics had prevailed, and trips to Broadstairs and Devonshire. In 1840, trips again to Bath, Birmingham, Shakespeare's country, Broadstairs, Devonshire. In 1841, more trips, and a very notable visit to Edinburgh, with which Little Nell had a great deal to do. For Lord Geoffrey was enamoured of that young lady, declaring to whomsoever would hear that there had been, quote, nothing so good since Cordelia, unquote, and inoculating the citizens of the northern capital with his enthusiasm, he had induced them to offer to Dickens a right royal banquet and the freedom of their city. Accordingly, to Edinburgh he repaired, and the dinner took place on the 26th of June, with 300 of the chief notabilities for entertainers, and a reception such as kings might have envied. Geoffrey himself was ill and unable to take the chair, but Wilson, the Leonine Christopher North, editor of Blackwood, an author of those Noctes Ambrosianae which were read so eagerly as they came out, and which some of us find so difficult to read now, Wilson presided most worthily. Of speechifying there was of course much, and compliments abounded, but the banquet itself, the whole reception at Edinburgh, was the most magnificent of compliments. Never, I imagine, can such efforts have been made to turn any young man's brain, as were made during this and the following year, to turn the head of Dickens, who was still, be it remembered, under thirty. Nevertheless, he came unscathed through the ordeal. A kind of manly genuineness bore him through. Amid all the adulation and excitement, the public and private hospitalities, the semi-regal state appearance at the theatre, he could write, and write truly to his friend Forrester, quote, Quote, the moral of this is that there is no place like home, and that I thank God most heartily for having given me a quiet spirit and a heart that won't hold many people. I sigh for Devonshire Terrace and Broadstairs, for Battledore and Shuttlecock. I want to dine in a blouse with you and Mac, MacLeese. On Sunday evening, the 17th July, I shall revisit my household gods. Please heaven, I wish the day were here. Unquote. Yes, except during the few years when he and his wife lived unhappily together, he was greatly attached to his home, with its friendships and simple pleasures. But yet, as I have said, a desire to see more of the world and to garner new experiences was strong upon him. The two conflicting influences often warred in his life, so that it almost seemed sometimes as if he were being driven by relentless furies. Those furies pointed now with stern fingers towards America, though, quote, how he was to get on for seven or eight months without his friends, he could not upon his soul conceive, though he dreaded to think of breaking up all his old happy habits for so long a time, though Kate, remembering doubtless her four little children, wept whenever the subject was spoken of, unquote. Something made him feel that the going was, quote, a matter of imperative necessity, unquote. Washington Irving beckoned from across the Atlantic, speaking, as Geoffrey had spoken from Edinburgh, of Little Nell and her far extended influence. There was a great reception foreshadowed, and a new world to be seen, and a book to be written about it. While as to the strongest of the home ties, the children that brought the tears into Mrs. Dickens' eyes, the separation, after all, would not be eternal, and the good MacReady, tragic actor and true friend, would take charge of the little folk while their parents were away. So Dickens, who had some time before, quote, begun counting the days between this and coming home again, unquote, set sail, as I have said, for America on the 4th of January, 1842. And a very rough experience he and Mrs. Dickens and Mrs. Dickens' maid seem to have had during that January passage from Liverpool to Halifax and Boston. Most of the time it blew horribly, and they were direfully ill, 
Then a storm supervened, which swept away the paddle boxes and stove in the lifeboats, and they seemed to have been in real peril. Next, the ship struck on a mud bank. But dangers and discomforts must have been forgotten, at any rate to begin with, in the glories of the reception that awaited the inimitable, as Dickens whimsically called himself in those days, when he landed in the New World. If he had been received with princely honors in Edinburgh, he was treated now as an emperor in some triumphant progress. Halifax sounded the first note of welcome, gave, as it were, the preliminary trumpet flourish. From that town, he writes, quote, I wish you could have seen the crowds cheering the inimitable in the streets. I wish you could have seen judges, law officers, bishops, and lawmakers welcoming the inimitable. I wish you could have seen the inimitable shown to a great elbow chair by the Speaker's throne, and sitting alone in the middle of the floor of the House of Commons, the observed of all observers, listening with exemplary gravity to the queerest speaking possible, and breaking, in spite of himself, into a smile, as he thought of this commencement to the thousand and one stories in reserve for home." Unquote. At Boston the enthusiasm had swelled to even greater proportions. Quote, "'How can I give you,' he writes, "'the faintest notion of my reception here, of the crowds that pour in and out the whole day, of the people that line the streets when I go out, of the cheering when I went to the theatre, of the copies of verses, letters of congratulation, welcomes of all kinds, balls, dinners, assemblies without end. There is to be a dinner in New York to which I have had an invitation with every known name in America appended to it. I have had deputations from the far west who have come from more than 2,000 miles distance, from the lakes, the rivers, the backwoods, the log houses, the cities, factories, villages, and towns. Authorities from nearly all the states have written to me. I have heard from the universities, Congress, Senate, and bodies, public and private, of every sort and kind." Unquote. All was indeed going happy as a marriage bell. Did I not rightly say that the world was conspiring to spoil this young man of thirty, whose youth had certainly not been passed in the splendor of opulence or power? What wonder if, in the dawn of his American experiences, and of such a reception, everything assumed a roseate hue. Is it matter for surprise if he found the women, quote, very beautiful, the general breeding neither stiff nor forward, the good nature universal, unquote, if he expatiated, not without a backward look at unprogressive old England, on the comparative comfort among the working classes and the absence of beggars in the streets? But alas, that rosy dawn ended, as rosy dawns sometimes will, in sleet and mist and very dirty weather. Before many weeks, before many days had flown, Dickens was writing in a very different spirit. On the 24th of February, in the midst of a perfect ovation of balls and dinners, he writes, quote, with reluctance, disappointment, and sorrow, that there is no country on the face of the earth where there is less freedom of opinion on any subject in reference to which there is a broad difference of opinion than in the United States, unquote. On the 22nd of March, he writes again to MacReady, who seems to have remonstrated with him on his growing discontent, quote, It is of no use. I am disappointed. This is not the republic I came to see. This is not the republic of my imagination. I infinitely prefer a liberal monarchy, even with its sickening accompaniment of court circulars, to such a government as this. The more I think of its youth and strength, the poorer and more trifling in a thousand aspects it appears in my eyes. In everything of which it is made a boast, excepting its education of the people and its care for poor children, it sinks immeasurably below the level I had placed it upon, and England, even England, bad and faulty as the old land is, and miserable as millions of her people are, rises in the comparison. Freedom of opinion, where is it? I see a press more mean and paltry and silly and disgraceful than any country I ever knew. In the respects of not being left alone, and of being horribly disgusted by tobacco chewing and tobacco spittle, I have suffered considerably." Unquote. Extracts like these could be multiplied to any extent, and the question arises, why did such a change come over the spirit of Dickens? Washington Irving, at the great New York dinner, had called him, quote, the guest of the nation, unquote. Why was the guest so quickly dissatisfied with his host, and quarreling with the character of his entertainment? Sheer physical fatigue, I think, had a good deal to do with it. Even at Boston, before he had begun to travel over the unending railways, watercourses, and chaotic coach roads of the Great Republic, that keynote had been sounded, 
quote, we are already, he had written, weary at times past all expression, unquote. Few men can wander with impunity out of their own professional sphere and undertake duties for which they have neither the training nor acquired tastes. Dickens was a writer, not a king, and here he was expected to hold a king's state and live in a king's publicity, but without the formal etiquette that hedge a king from intruders and make his position tolerable. He was hemmed in by curious eyes, mobbed in the streets, stared at in his own private rooms, interviewed by the hour, shaken by the hand till his arm must often have been ready to drop off, waylaid at every turn with formal addresses. If he went to church, the people crowded into the adjacent pews, and the preacher preached at him. If he got into a public conveyance, every one inside insisted on an introduction, and the people outside, say, before the train started, would pull down the windows and comment freely on his nose and eyes and personal appearance generally, some even touching him as if to see if he were real. He was safe from intrusion nowhere, no, not when he was washing and his wife in bed. Such attentions must have been exhausting to a degree that can scarcely be imagined. But there was more than mere physical weariness in his growing distaste for the United States. Perfectly outspoken at all times, and eager for the strife of tongues in any cause which he had at heart, it horrified him to find that he was expected not to express himself freely on such subjects as international copyright, and that even in private or semi-private intercourse, slavery was a topic to be avoided. Then I fear, too, that as he left cultured Boston behind, he was brought into close and habitual contact with natives whom he did not appreciate. Rightly or wrongly, he took a strong dislike for Brother Jonathan as Brother Jonathan existed in the rough five and forty years ago. He was angered by that young gentleman's brag, offended by the rough familiarity of his manners, indignant at his determination by all means to acquire dollars, incensed by his utter want of care for literature and art, sickened by his tobacco-chewing and expectorations. So, when Dickens gets to, quote, Niagara Falls upon the English side, unquote, he puts ten dashes under the word English, and, meeting two English officers, contrasts them in thought with the men whom he has just left, and seems, by note of exclamation and italics, to call upon the world to witness, quote, what gentlemen, what noblemen of nature they seemed, unquote. And Brother Jonathan, how did he regard his young guest? While well, Jonathan, great as he was, and greater as he was destined to be, did not possess the gift of prophecy, and could not, of course, foresee the scathing satire of American Notes and Martin Chuzzlewit. But still, amid all his enthusiasm, I think there must have been a feeling of uneasiness and disappointment. Part, as there is no doubt, of the fervor with which he greeted Dickens was due to his regarding Dickens as the representative of democratic feeling in aristocratic England as the advocate of the poor and downtrodden against the wealthy and the strong. And, thus argued Jonathan, quote, because we are a democracy, therefore Dickens will admire and love us and see how immeasurably superior we are to the retrograde Britishers of his native land, unquote. But unfortunately Dickens showed no signs of being impressed in that particular way. On the contrary, as we have seen, such comparison as he made in his own mind was infinitely to the disadvantage of the United States. We must be cracked up, says Hannibal Chollop in Martin Chuzzlewit, speaking of his fellow countrymen. And Dickens, even while feted and honored, would not crack up the Americans. He lectured them almost with truculence on their sins in the matter of copyright. He could scarcely be restrained from testifying against slavery. He was not the man to say he liked manners and customs which he loathed. Jonathan must have been very doubtfully satisfied with his guest. It is no part of my purpose to follow Dickens lingeringly and step by step from the day when he landed at Halifax to the 7th of June when he re-embarked at New York for England. From Boston he went to New York, where the great dinner was given with Washington Irving in the chair, and thence to Philadelphia and Washington, which was still the empty, quote, city of magnificent distances, unquote, that Mr. Goldwyn Smith declares it has now ceased to be, and thence again westward, and by Niagara and Canada back to New York. And if any persons want to know what he thought about these and other places, and the railway traveling, and the coach traveling, and the steamboat traveling, and the prisons and other public institutions, I and many other things besides, they cannot do better than read the American Notes for General Circulation, which he wrote and published within the year after his return. Nor need such persons be deterred by the fact that Macaulay thought meanly of the book, 
for macaulay with all his great gifts did not as he himself knew full well excel in purely literary criticism so when he pronounces that quote, what is meant to be easy and sprightly is vulgar and flippant and what is meant to be fine is a great deal too fine for me as the description of the falls of niagara unquote, one can venture to differ without too great a pang the book though not assuredly one of dickens best contains admirable passages which none but he could have written and the description of niagara is noticeably fine the sublimity of the subject being remembered as a piece of impassioned prose whether satire so bitter and unfriendly as that in which he indulged both here and in martin chuzzlewit was justifiable from what may be called an international point of view is another question publicists do not always remember that a cut which would be smart for a moment and then be forgotten if aimed at a countryman rankles and festers if administered to a foreigner and if this be true as regards the english publicist's comment on the foreigner who does not understand our language it is of course true with tenfold force as regards the foreigner whose language is our own he understands only too well the jibe and the sneer and the tone of superiority more offensive perhaps than either looked at in this way it can i think but be accounted a misfortune that the most popular of english writers penned two books containing so much calculated to wound american feeling as the notes and martin chuzzlewit nor are signs entirely wanting that as the years went by the mind of dickens himself was haunted by some such suspicion a quarter of a century later he visited the united states a second time and speaking at a public dinner given in his honor by the journalists of new york he took occasion to comment on the enormous strides which the country had made in the interval and then said quote, nor am i believe me so arrogant as to suppose that in five and twenty years there have been no changes in me and that i had nothing to learn and no extreme impressions to correct when i was here first unquote. and he added that in all future editions of the two books just named he would cause to be recorded that quote, wherever he had been in the smallest place equally with the largest he had been received with unsurpassable politeness delicacy sweet temper hospitality consideration and with unsurpassable respect for the privacy daily enforced upon him by the nature of his avocation there as a public reader and the state of his health unquote. and now with three observations i will conclude what i have to say about the visit to america in eighteen forty two the first is that the notes are entirely void of all vulgarity of reference to the private life of the notable americans whom dickens had met he seems to have known more or less intimately the chief writers of the time washington irving channing dana bryant longfellow bancroft but his intercourse with them he held sacred and he made no literary capital out of it secondly it is pleasant to note that there was so far no great incompatibility of temper between him and his wife he speaks of her enthusiastically in his correspondence as a quote, most admirable traveler Unquote, and expatiates on the good temper and equanimity with which she had borne the fatigues and jars of a most trying journey and the third point to which i will call attention is the thoroughly characteristic form of rest to which he had recourse in the midst of all his toil and travel most men would have sought relaxation in being quiet he found it in vigorously getting up private theatricals with the officers of the coldstream guards at montreal besides acting in all the three pieces played he also accepted the part of stage manager and quote, i am not he says placarded as stage manager for nothing everybody was told that they would have to submit to the most iron despotism and didn't i come macready over them oh no by no means certainly not the pains i have taken with them and the perspiration i have expended during the last ten days exceed in amount anything you can imagine unquote what bright vitality and what a singular charm of exuberant animal spirits and who was glad one evening which would be about the last evening in june or the first of july when a hackney coach rattled up to the door of the house in devonshire terrace and four little folk two girls and two boys were hurried down and kissed through the bars of the gate because their father was too eager to wait until it was opened who were glad but the little folk aforementioned i say nothing of the joy of father and mother for children as they were a sense of sorrowful loss had been theirs while their parents were away and greater strictness seems to have reigned in the good macready's household than in their own joyous home it is miss dickens herself who tells us this and in whose memory has lingered that pretty scene of the kiss through the bars in the summer gloaming 
and she has much to tell us, too, of her father's tenderness and care, of his sympathy with the children's terrors, so that, for instance, he would sit beside the cot of one of the little girls who had been startled, and hold her hand in his till she fell asleep, of his having them on his knees and singing to them the merriest of comic songs, of his interest in all their small concerns, of the many pet names with which he invested them. Footnote. Miss Dickens evidently bears proudly still her pet name of Mamie and signs it to her book. End of footnote. Then, as they grew older, there were Twelfth Night Parties and Magic Lanterns. Quote, never such magic lanterns as those shown by him, she says, never such conjuring as his, unquote. There was dancing, too, and the little ones taught him his steps, which he practiced with much assiduity, once even jumping out of bed in terror lest he had forgotten the polka, and indulging in a solitary midnight rehearsal. Then, as the children grew older still, they were private theatricals. Quote, he never, she says again, was too busy to interest himself in his children's occupations, lessons, amusements, and general welfare. Unquote. Clearly not one of those brilliant men, a numerous race, who, when away from their homes in general society, sparkle and scintillate, flash out their wit, and irradiate all with their humor, but who, when at home, are dull as rusted steel. Among the many tributes to his greatness, that of his own child has a place at once touching and beautiful. End of chapter 6. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 7 of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziaus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. With the return from America began the old life of hard work and hard play. There was much industrious writing of American notes at Broadstairs and elsewhere, and there were many dinners of welcome home and strolls, doubtless, with Forster and MacLeese, and other intimates, to old haunts as Jack Straw's Castle on Hampstead Heath, and similar houses of public entertainment. And then in the autumn there was, quote, such a trip into Cornwall, unquote, with Forrester and the painters Stanfield and MacLeese for traveling companions. How they enjoyed themselves to be sure, and with what bubbling, bursting merriment. Quote, I never laughed in my life as I did on this journey, writes Dickens. I was choking and gasping all the way, and Stanfield got into such apoplectic entanglements that we were often obliged to beat him on the back with portmanteaus before we could recover him." Unquote. Immediately on their return, refreshed and invigorated by this wholesome hilarity and enjoyment, he threw himself into the composition of his next book, and the first number of Martin Chuzzlewit appeared in January 1843. Martin Chuzzlewit is unquestionably one of Dickens' great works. He himself held it to be, quote, in a hundred points, unquote, and immeasurably superior to anything he had before written, and that verdict may, I think, be accepted freely. The plot, as plot is usually understood, can scarcely indeed be commended, but then plot was never his strong point. Later in life, and acting, as I have always surmised, under the influence of his friend Mr. Wilkie Collins, he endeavored to construct ingenious stories that turned on mysterious disappearances and the substitution of one person for another, and murders real or suspected. All this was, to my mind, a mistake. Dickens had no real gift for the manufacture of these ingenious pieces of mechanism. He did not even many times succeed in disposing the events and marshalling the characters in his narratives so as to work, by seemingly unforced and natural means, to a final situation and climax. Too often, in order to hold his story together and make it move forward at all, he was compelled to make his personages pursue a line of conduct preposterous and improbable, and even antagonistic to their nature. Take this very book. Old Martin Chuzzlewit is a man who has been accustomed all through a long life to have his own way, and to take it with a high hand. Yet he so far sets aside, during a course of months, every habit of his life, as to simulate the weakest subservience to Pecksniff, and that not for the purpose of unmasking Pecksniff, who wanted no unmasking, but only in order to disappoint him. Is it believable that old Martin should have thought Pecksniff worth so much trouble, personal inconvenience, and humiliation? Or take again Mr. Boffin in Our Mutual Friend. Mr. Boffin is a simple, guileless, open-hearted, open-handed old man, 
yet in order to prove to miss bella wilfer that it is not well to be mercenary he again goes through a long course of dissimulation and does some admirable comic business in the character of a miser i say it boldly i do not believe mr boffin possessed that amount of histrionic talent plots requiring to be worked out by such means are ill-constructed plots or to put it another way a man who had any gift for the construction of plots would never have had recourse to such means nor would he i think have adopted as dickens did habitually and for all his stories a mode of publication so destructive of unity of effect as the publication in monthly or weekly parts how could the reader see as a whole that which was presented to him at intervals of time more or less distant how and this is of infinitely greater importance could the writer produce it as a whole for dickens it must be remembered never finished a book before the commencement of publication at first he scarcely did more than complete each monthly installment as required and though afterwards he was generally some little way in advance yet always he wrote by parts having the interest of each separate part in his mind as well as the general interest of the whole novel thus however desirable in the development of the story he dared not risk a comparatively tame and uneventful number moreover any portion once issued was unalterable and irrevocable if as sometimes happened any modification seemed desirable as the book progressed there was no possibility of changing anything in the chapters already in the hands of the public and so making them harmonize better with the new but of course with all this the question still remains how far dickens comparative failure as a constructor of plots really detracts from his fame and standing as a novelist to my mind i confess not very much plot i regard as the least essential element in the novelist's art a novel can take the very highest rank without it there is not any plot to speak of in le sage's gil blas and just as little in thackeray's vanity fair and only a very bad one in goldsmith's vicar of wakefield coleridge admired the plot of tom jones but though one naturally hesitates to differ from a critic of such superb mastery and power i confess i have never been struck by that plot any more than by the plots such as they are in joseph andrews or in smollett's works nor if i can judge of other people's memories by my own it is by the mechanism of the story or by the intrigue however admirably woven and unraveled that one remembers a work of fiction these may exercise an intense passing interest of curiosity especially during a first perusal but afterwards they fade from the mind while the characters if highly vitalized and strong will stand out in our thoughts fresh and full-colored for an indefinite time scott's guy mannering is a well-constructed story the plot is deftly laid the events are prepared for with a cunning hand the coincidences are so arranged as to be made to look as probable as may be yet we remember and love this book not for such excellences as these but for dandy dinmont the border farmer and playdell the edinburgh advocate and meg Marillies, the gypsy the book's life is in its flesh and blood not in its plot and the same is true of dickens novels he crowds them so full of human creatures each with its own individuality and character that we have no care for more than just as much story as may serve to show them struggling joying sorrowing loving if the incidents will do this for us we are satisfied it is not necessary that those incidents should be made to go through cunning evolutions to a definite end each is admirable in itself and admirably adapted to its immediate purpose that should more than suffice and dickens sometimes succeeds in reaching a higher unity than that of mere plot he takes one central idea and makes of it the soul of his novel animating and vivifying every part the central idea in martin chuzzlewit is the influence of selfishness the chuzzlewits are a selfish race old martin is selfish and so with many good qualities and possibilities of better things is his grandson young martin the other branch of the family anthony chuzzlewit and his son jonas are much worse the latter especially is a horrible creature brought up to think of nothing except his own interests and the main chance he is only saved by an accident from the crime of parricide and afterwards commits a murder and poisons himself as his career is one of terrible descent so young martin's is one of gradual regeneration from his besetting weakness he falls in love with his cousin mary the only unselfish member of the family by the by and quarrels about this love affair with his grandfather and so passes into the hard school of adversity 
There he learns much. Specially valuable is the teaching which he gets as a settler in the swampy backwoods of the United States, in company with Mark Tapley, jolliest and most helpful of men. On his return he finds his grandfather, seemingly under the influence of Pecksniff the hypocrite, the English Tartuffe. But that, as I have already mentioned, is only a ruse. Old Martin is deceiving Pecksniff, who in due time receives the reward of his deeds, and all ends happily for those who deserve happiness. Such is something like a bare outline of the story with the beauty eliminated. For what makes its interest, we must go further, to the household of Pecksniff with his two daughters, Charity and Mercy, and Tom Pinch, whose beautiful, unselfish character stands so in contrast to that of the grasping self-seekers by whom he is surrounded. We must study young Martin himself, whose character is admirably drawn, and without Dickens' usual tendency to caricature. We must laugh in sympathy with Mark Tapley. We must follow them both through the American scenes, which, intensely amusing as they are, must have bitterly envenomed the wounds inflicted on the national vanity by American notes. And according to Dickens' own expression, quote, sent them all stark, staring, raving mad across the water, unquote. We must frequent the boarding establishment for single gentlemen kept by lean Mrs. Todgers, and sit with Sarah Gamp and Betsy Prigg as they hideously discuss their avocations, or quarrel over the shadowy Mrs. Harris. We must follow Jonas Chuzzlewit on his errand of murder, and note how even his felon nature is appalled by the blackness and horror of his guilt, and how the ghastly terror of it haunts and cows him. A great book, I say again, a very great book yet not at the time a successful book. Why Fortune, the fickle jade, should have taken it into her freakish head to frown or half frown on Dickens at this particular juncture, who shall tell? He was wooing her with his very best work, and she turned from him. The sale of Pickwick and Nicholas Nickleby had been from forty to 50,000 copies of each part. The sale of Master Humphrey's clock had risen still higher. The sale of even the most popular parts of Martin Chuzzlewit fell to 23,000. This was, as may be supposed, a grievous disappointment. Dickens' personal expenditure had not perhaps been lavish in view of what he thought he could calculate on earning, but it had been freely based on that calculation. Demands, too, were being made upon his purse by relations, probably by his father and certainly by his brother Frederick, which were frequent, embarrassing, and made in a way which one may call worse than indelicate. Any permanent loss of popularity would have meant serious money entanglements. With his father's career in full view, such a prospect must have been anything but pleasant. He cast about what he should do, and determined to leave England for a space, live more economically on the continent, and gather materials in Italy or Switzerland for a new travel book. But before carrying out this project, he would woo fortune once again, and in a different form. During the months of October and November, 1843, in the intervals of Chuzzlewit, he wrote a short story that has taken its place by almost universal consent among his masterpieces, nay, among the masterpieces of English literature, The Christmas Carol. All Dickens' great gifts seem reflected, sharp and distinct, in this little book as in a convex mirror. His humor, his best pathos, which is not that of grandiloquence, but of simplicity. His bright poetic fancy, his kindliness, all here find a place. It is a great painting in miniature, genius in its quintessence, a gem of perfect water. We may apply to it any simile that implies excellence in the smallest compass. None but a fine imagination would have conceived the supernatural agency that works old Scrooge's moral regeneration, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and to come that each in turn speaks to the wizened heart of the old miser, so that almost unwittingly he is softened by the tender memories of childhood, warmed by sympathy for those who struggle and suffer, and appalled by the prospect of his own ultimate desolation and black solitude. Then the episodes, the scenes to which these ghostly visitants convey Scrooge, the story of his earlier years as shown in vision, the household of the Cratchits and poor little crippled Tiny Tim, the party given by Scrooge's nephew, nay, before all these, the terrible interview with Marley's ghost. All are admirably executed. Sacrilege would be to suggest the alteration of a word. First of the Christmas books in the order of time, it is also the best of its kind. It is in its own order perfect. Nor did the public of Christmas 1843 fail to appreciate that something of very excellent quality had been brought forth for their benefit. 
quote, the first edition of 6,000 copies, says Forrester, was sold, unquote, on the day of publication, and about as many more would seem to have been disposed of before the end of February 1844. But alas, Dickens had set his heart on a profit of 1,000 pounds, whereas in February he did not see his way to much more than 460 pounds, and his unpaid bills for the previous year he described as, quote, terrific, unquote. So something, as I have said, had to be done. A change of front became imperative. Messrs. Bradbury and Evans advanced him £2,800 for a fourth share in whatever he might write during the ensuing eight years. He purchased at the Pantechnicon, quote, a good old shabby devil of a coach, also described as an English traveling carriage of considerable proportions, unquote, engaged a courier who turned out to be the carrier of carriers, a very conjurer among carriers, let his house in Devonshire Terrace, and so started off for Italy, as I calculate the dates, on the 1st of July, 1844. End of chapter 7. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 8 of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Ah, those eventful, picturesque, uncomfortable old traveling days, when railways were unborn or in their infancy, those interminable old dusty drives in diligence or private carriage along miles and miles of roads running straight to the low horizon, through a line of tall poplars, across the plains of France. What an old world memory it seems, and yet, as the years go, not so very long since, after all. The party that rumbled from Boulogne to Marseille in the old, quote, devil of a coach aforesaid, and another conveyance for luggage, unquote, and I know not what other conveyances besides, consisted of Dickens himself, Mrs. Dickens, her sister, Miss Georgina Hogarth, who had come to live with them on their return from America, five children, for another boy had been born some six months before, Roche, the prince of couriers, Anne, apparently the same maid who had accompanied them across the Atlantic, and other dependents, a somewhat formidable troop and cavalcade, of their mode of travel and what they saw on the way, or perhaps more accurately of what Dickens saw, with those specially keen eyes of his, at Lyon, Avignon, Marseille, and other places, one may read the master's own account in the pictures from Italy. Marseille was reached on the 14th of July, and thence a steamer took them, coasting the fairy Mediterranean shores to Genoa, their ultimate destination, where they landed on the 16th. The Italy of 1844 was like and yet unlike the Italy of today. It was the old disunited Italy of several small kingdoms and principalities, the Italy over which lowered the shadow of despotic Austria and of the Pope's temporal power, not the Italy which the genius of Cavour has welded into a nation. It was a land whose interest came altogether from the past, and that lay as if it were in the beauty of time's sunset. How unlike the United States! The contrast is always, I confess, seemed to me a piquant one. It has often struck me with a feeling of quaintness that the two countries which Dickens specially visited and described were the one this lovely land of age and hoar antiquity, and the other that young giant land of the West, which is still in the garish strong light of morning, and whose great day is in the future. Nor, I think, before he had seen both, would Dickens himself have been able to tell on which side his sympathies would lie. Thoroughly popular in his convictions, thoroughly satisfied that today was in all respects better than yesterday, it is clear that he expected to find more pleasure in the brand new republic than his actual experience warranted. The roughness of the strong, uncultured young life grated upon him. It jarred upon his sensibilities. But of Italy he wrote with very different feeling. What though the places were dirty, the people shiftless, idle, unpunctual, unbusinesslike, and the fleas as the sand which is upon the seashore for multitude. It mattered not while life was so picturesque and varied, and manners were so full of amenity. Your inn might be, and probably was, ill-appointed, untidy, the floors of brick, the doors agape, the windows banging, a contrast in every way to the palatial hotel in New York or Washington. But then, how cheerful and amusing were mine host and hostess, and how smilingly determined all concerned to make things pleasant. 
So the artist in Dickens turned from the new to the old, and Italy, as she is wont, cast upon him her spell. First impressions, however, were not altogether satisfactory. Dickens owns to a pang when he was set down at Albero, a suburb of Genoa, quote, in a rank, dull, weedy courtyard, attached to a kind of pink jail, and told he lived there, unquote. But he immediately adds, quote, I little thought that day that I should ever come to have an attachment for the very stones in the streets of Genoa, and to look back upon the city with affection, as connected with many hours of happiness and quiet, unquote. In sooth, he enjoyed the place thoroughly. Martin Chuzzlewit had left his hands. He was fairly entitled for a few weeks to the luxury of idleness, and he threw himself into doing nothing, as he was accustomed to throw himself into his work, with all energy. And there was much to do, much especially to see. So Dickens bathed and walked and strolled about the city hither and thither, and about the suburbs and about the surrounding country, and visited public buildings and private palaces, and noted the ways of the inhabitants and saw Genoese life in its varied forms, and wrote light, glancing letters about it all to friends at home, and learnt Italian, and in the end of September he left his pink jail, which had been taken for him at a disproportionate rent, and moved into the Palazzo Pesciri, in Genoa itself, a wonderful palace with an entry hall fifty feet high, and larger than, quote, the dining room of the academy, and bedrooms in size and shape like those at Windsor Castle, but greatly higher, unquote and a view from the windows over gardens where the many fountains sparkled and the goldfish glinted, and into Genoa itself with its, quote, many churches, monasteries, and convents pointing to the sunny sky, unquote. and into the harbor and over the sapphire sea and up again to the encircling hills, a view, as Dickens declared, that, quote, no custom could impair and no description enhance, unquote. But with the beginning of October came again the time for work, and beautiful beyond all beauty as were his surroundings, the child of London turned to the home of his heart and pined for the London streets. For some little space he seemed to be thinking in vain, and cudgeling his brains for naught, when suddenly the chimes of Genoa's many churches, that seemed to have been clashing and clanging nothing but distraction and madness, rang harmony into his mind. The subject and title of his new Christmas book were found. He threw himself into the composition of The Chimes. Ernest at all times in what he wrote, living ever in intense and passionate sympathy with the world of his imagination, he seems specially to have put his whole heart into this book. Quote, all my affections and passions got twined and knotted up in it, and I became as haggard as a murderer long before I wrote the end. Unquote. So he told Lady Blessington on the 20th of November, and to Forster he expressed the yearning that was in him to, quote, leave his hand upon the time, lastingly upon the time, with one tender touch for the mass of toiling people that nothing could obliterate, unquote. This was the keynote of the chimes. He intended in it to strike a great and memorable blow on behalf of the poor and downtrodden. His purpose, so far as I can make it out, was to show how much excuse there is for their shortcomings, and how in their errors, nay, even in their crimes, there linger traces of goodness and kindly feelings. On this I shall have something to say when discussing hard times, which is somewhat akin to the chimes in scope and purpose. Meanwhile, it cannot honestly be affirmed that the story justifies the passion that Dickens threw into its composition. The supernatural machinery is weak as compared with that of the carol. Little Trotty Veck, dreaming to the sound of the bells in the old church tower, is a bad substitute for Scrooge on his midnight rambles. Nor are his dreams at all equal for humor or pathos to Scrooge's visions and experiences, and the moral itself is not clearly brought out. I confess to being a little doubtful as to what it exactly is and how it follows from the premises furnished. I wish, too, that it had been carried home to someone with more power than little Trotty to give it effect. What was the good of convincing that kindly old soul that the people of his own class had warm hearts. He knew it very well. Take from the book the fine imaginative description of the goblin music that leaps into life with the ringing of the bells, and there remain the most excellent intentions, and not much more. Such, however, was very far from being Dickens' view. He had, quote, undergone, he said, as much sorrow and agitation in the writing as if the thing were real, unquote. 
and on the 3rd of November, when the last page was written, had indulged, quote, in what women call a good cry, unquote. And, as usually happens, the child that had cost much sorrow was a child of special love. Footnote. He read the chimes at his first reading as a paid reader. End of footnote. So, when all was over, nothing would do, but he must come to London to read his book to the choice literary spirits whom he specially loved. Accordingly, he started from Genoa on the 6th of November, traveled by Parma, Modena, Bologna, Ferrara, Venice, where such was the enchantment of the place that he felt it, quote, cruel not to have brought Kate and Georgie, positively cruel and base, unquote, and thence again by Verona, Mantua, Milan, the Simplon Pass, Strasbourg, Paris, and Calais, to Dover and wintry England. Sharp work, considering all he had seen by the way and how effectually he had seen it, for he was in London on the evening of the 30th of November, and on the 2nd of December reading his little book to the choice spirits aforesaid, all assembled for the purpose at Forster's house. There they are, they live for us still in MacLeese's drawing, though time has plied his scythe among them so effectually, during the forty-two years since flown, that each has passed into the silent land. There they sit, Carlyle, not the shaggy Scotch terrier with the melancholy eyes that we were wont to see in his later days, but close-shaven and alert, and swift-witted Douglas Gerald, and Leman Blanchard, whose name goes darkling in the literature of the last generation, and Forster himself, journalist and author of many books, and the painters Dice, MacLeese, and Stanfield, and Byron's friend and school companion, the clergyman Harness, who, like Dice, pays to the story the tribute of his tears. Dickens can have been in London but the fewest of few days, for on the 13th of December he was leaving Paris for Genoa, and that after going to the theatre more than once. From Genoa he started again on the 20th of January, 1845, with Mrs. Dickens, to see the carnival at Rome. Thence he went to Naples, returning to Rome for the Holy Week, and thence again by Florence to Genoa. He finally left Italy in the beginning of June, and was back with his family in Devonshire Terrace at the end of that month. To what use of a literary kind should he turn his Italian observations and experiences? In what form should he publish the notes made by the way? Events soon answered that question. The year 1845 stands in the history of Queen Victoria's reign as a time of intense political excitement. The Corn Law agitation raged somewhat furiously. Dickens felt strongly impelled to throw himself into the strife. Why should he not influence his fellow men and, quote, battle for the true, the just, unquote, as the able editor of a daily newspaper? Accordingly, after all the negotiations which enterprises of this kind necessitate, he made the due arrangements for starting a new paper, the Daily News. It was to be edited by himself to, quote, be kept free, the prospectus said, from personal influence or party bias, and to be devoted to the advocacy of all rational and honest means by which wrong may be redressed, just rights maintained, and the happiness and welfare of society promoted, unquote. His salary, so I have seen it stated, was to be £2,000 a year, and the first number came out on the morning of the 21st of January, 1846. He held the post of editor three weeks. The world may, I think, on the whole, be congratulated that he did not hold it longer. Able editors are more easily found than such writers as Dickens. There were higher claims upon his time. But to return to the Italian notes, it was in the columns of the Daily News that they first saw the light. They were among the baby attractions and charms, if I may so speak, of the nascent paper, which is now, as I need not remind my readers, enjoying a hale and vigorous manhood. And admirable sketches they are. Much, very much, has been written about Italy. The subject has been done to death by every variety of pen and in every civilized tongue. But amid all this writing, Dickens' Pictures from Italy still holds a high and distinctive position. That the descriptions, whether of places and works of art, or of life's pageantry, and what may be called the social picturesque, should be graphic, vivid, animated, was almost a matter of course. But a priori, I think one might have feared lest he should chaff the place and its inhabitants overmuch, and yield to the temptation of making merriment over matters which hoar age and old associations had hallowed. We can all imagine the kind of observation that would occur to Sam Weller, 
in strolling through St. Mark's at Venice or the Vatican, and guessing beforehand, guessing before the pictures were produced, one might, I repeat, have been afraid lest Dickens should go through Italy as a kind of educated Sam Weller. Such prophecies would have been falsified by the event. The book as a whole is very free from banter or persiflage. Once and again the comic side of some situation strikes him, of course. Thus, after the ceremony of the Pope washing the feet of thirteen poor men, in memory of our Lord washing the feet of the apostles, Dickens says, quote, The whole thirteen sat down to dinner, grace said by the Pope, Peter in the chair, unquote. But these humorous touches are rare and not in bad taste, while for the historic and artistic grandeurs of Italy he shows an enthusiasm which is individual and discriminating. We feel, in what he says about painting, that we are getting the fresh impressions of a man not specially trained in the study of the old masters, but he yet succeeds by sheer intuitive sympathy in appreciating much of their greatness. His criticism of the paintings at Venice, for instance, is very decidedly superior to that of Macaulay. In brief, the pictures, to give to the book the name which Dickens gave it, are painted with a brush at once kindly and brilliant. End of chapter 8. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 9 of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziales. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The publication of the pictures, though I have dealt with it as a sort of compliment to Dickens' sojourn in Italy, carries us to the year 1846. But before going on with the history of that year, there are one or two points to be taken up in the history of 1845. The first is the performance, on the 21st of September, of Ben Jonson's play of Every Man in His Humor, by a select company of amateur actors, among whom Dickens held chief place. Quote, he was the life and soul of the entire affair, says Forster. I never seem till then to have known his business capabilities. He took everything on himself and did the whole of it without an effort. He was stage director, very often stage carpenter, scene arranger, property man, prompter, and bandmaster. Without offending anyone, he kept everyone in order. For all, he had useful suggestions. He adjusted scenes, assisted carpenters, invented costumes, devised playbills, wrote out calls, and enforced, as well as exhibited in his own proper person, everything of which he urged the necessity on others." Unquote. Dickens had once thought of the stage as a profession, and was, according to all accounts, an amateur actor of very unusual power. But of course he only acted for his amusement, and I don't know that I should have dwelt upon this performance, which was followed by others of a similar kind, if it did not, in Forrester's description, afford such a signal instance of his efficiency as a practical man. The second event to be mentioned as happening in 1845 is the publication of another very pretty Christmas story, The Cricket on the Hearth. Though Dickens had ceased to edit the Daily News on the 9th of February, 1846, he contributed to the paper for some few weeks longer. But by the month of May, his connection with it had entirely ceased, and on the 31st of that month, he started, by Belgium and the Rhine, for Lausanne in Switzerland, where he had determined to spend some time, and commence his next great book and write his next Christmas story. A beautiful place is Lausanne, as many of my readers will know, and a beautiful house, the house called Rosemont, situated on a hill that rises from the Lake of Geneva, with the lake's blue waters stretching below, and across, on the other side, a magnificent panorama of snowy mountains, the Simplon, St. Gothard, Mount Blanc, towering to the sky. This delightful place Dickens took at a rent of some ten pounds a month. Then he rearranged all the furniture, as was his energetic want. Then he spent a fortnight or so in looking about him, and writing a good deal for Lord John Russell on ragged schools, and for Miss Coutts about her various charities. And finally, on the 28th of June, as he announced to Forrester in capital letters, began Dombey. But as the Swiss pine with homesickness went away from their own dear land, so did this Londoner amid all the glories of the Alps, pine for the London streets. It seemed almost as if they were essential to the exercise of his genius. The same strange mental phenomenon which he had observed in himself at Genoa was reproduced here. Everything else in his surroundings smiled most congenially. 
the place was fair beyond speech the shifting changing beauty of the mountains entranced him the walks offered an endless variety of enjoyment he liked the people he liked the english colony he had made several dear friends among them and among the natives he was interested in the politics of the country which happened just then to be in a state of peculiar excitement and revolution everything was charming Quote, but he writes the toil and labor of writing day after day without that magic lantern of the london streets is immense unquote. it literally knocked him up he had bad nights was sick and giddy desponding over his book more than half inclined to abandon the christmas story altogether for that year however a short trip to geneva and the dissipation of a stroll or so in its thoroughfares to remind him as it were of what streets were like and a week of idleness rusting and devouring complete and unbroken set him comparatively on his legs again and before he left lausanne for paris on the sixteenth of november he had finished three parts of dombey and the battle of life of the latter i don't know that i need say anything it is decidedly the weakest of his christmas books but dombey is very different work and the first five numbers especially which carry the story to the death of little paul contain passages of humor and pathos and of humor and pathos mingled together and shot in warp and woof like some daintiest silken fabric that are scarcely to be matched in the language as i go in my mind through the motherless child's short history his birth his christening the engagement of the wet nurse the time when he is consigned to the loveless care of mrs pipchin his education in dr blimber's academy under the classic cornelia and his death as i follow it all in thought now smiling at each well-remembered touch of humor and now saddened and solemnized as the shadow of death deepens over the frail little life i confess to something more than critical admiration for the writer as an artist i feel towards him as towards one who has touched my heart of course it is the misfortune of the book regarding it as a whole that the chapters relating to paul which are only an episode should be of such absorbing interest and come so early Dickens really wrote them too well. They dwarf the rest of the story. We find a difficulty in resuming the thread of it with the same zest when the child is gone. But, though the remainder of the book inevitably suffers in this way, it ought not to suffer unduly. Even apart from Little Paul, the novel is a fine one. Pride is its subject, as selfishness is that of Martin Chuzzlewit. Mr. Dombey, the city merchant, has as much of the arrogance of caste and position as any blue-blooded Hidalgo. He is as proud of his name as if he had inherited it from a race of princes. That he neglects and slights his daughter, and loves his son, is mainly because the latter will add a sort of completeness to the firm, and make it truly Dombey and Son, while the girl, for all commercial purposes, can be nothing but a cipher. And through his pride he is struck to the heart and ruined. Mr. Carker, his confidential agent and manager, trades upon it for all vile ends, first to feather his own nest and then to launch his patron into large and unsound business ventures the second wife whom he marries certainly with no affection on either side but purely because of her birth and connections and because her great beauty will add to his social prestige she with ungovernable pride equal to his own revolts against his authority and in order to humiliate him the more pretends to elope with carker whom in turn she scorns and crushes Broken thus in fortune and honor, Mr. Dombey yet falls not ignobly. His creditors he satisfies in full, reserving to himself nothing, and with a softened heart turns to the daughter he had slighted, and in her love finds comfort. Such is the main purport of the story, and round it, in graceful arabesques, are embroidered, after Dickens' manner, a whole world of subsidiary incidents thronged with all sorts of characters what might not one say about dr blimber's genteel academy at brighton and the toodles family so humble in station and intellect and so large of heart and the contrast between carker the manager and his brother for whom some early dishonest act long since repented of remains always carker the junior and about captain cuttle and that poor muddled nautical philosopher captain bunsby and the game chicken and mrs pipchin and miss tox and cousin phoenix with wilful legs so little under control and yet to the core of him a gentleman and the apoplectic major bagstock the joey b who claimed to be quote, rough and tough and devilish sly unquote, 
and susan nipper as swift of tongue as a rapier and as sharp reader don't you know all these people for myself i have jostled against them constantly any time the last twenty years they are as much part of my life as the people i meet every day but there is one person whom i have left out of my enumeration not certainly because i don't know him for i know him very well but because i want to speak about him more particularly that person is my old friend mr toots and the special point in his character which induces me to linger is the slight touch of craziness that sits so charmingly upon him monsieur ten the french critic in his chapters on dickens repeats the old remark that genius and madness are near akin footnote history of english literature volume five end of footnote he observes and observes truly that dickens describes so well because an imagination of singular intensity enables him to see the object presented and at the same time to impart to it a kind of visionary life quote, that imagination says m ten is akin to the imagination of the monomaniac unquote. and starting from this point he proceeds to show here again quite truly with what admirable sympathetic power and insight dickens has described certain cases of madness as in mr dick but here having said some right things m ten goes all wrong according to him these portraits of persons who have lost their wits quote, however amusing they may seem at first sight are horrible unquote. they could only have been painted by quote, an imagination such as that of dickens excessive disordered and capable of hallucination unquote. he seems to be not far from thinking that only our splenetic and melancholy race could have given birth to such literary monsters to speak like this as i conceive shows a singular misconception of the instinct or set purpose that led dickens to introduce these characters into his novels at all it is perfectly true that he has done so several times barnaby rudge the hero of the book of the same name is half-witted mr dick and david copperfield is decidedly crazy mr toots is at least simple little miss flight in bleak house haunting the law courts in expectation of a judgment on the day of judgment is certainly not compos mentis and one may concede to monsieur ten that some element of sadness must always be present when we see a human creature imperfectly gifted with man's noblest attribute of reason but granting this to the full is it possible to conceive of anything more kindly and gentle in the delineation of partial insanity than the portraits which the french critic finds horrible barnaby rudge's lunatic symptoms are compatible with the keenest enjoyment of nature's sights and sounds fresh air and free sunlight and compatible with loyalty and high courage many men might profitably change their reason for his unreason mr dick's flightiness is allied to an intense devotion and gratitude to the woman who had rescued him from confinement in an asylum there lives a world of kindly sentiments in his poor bewildered brains of mr toots susan nipper says truly quote, he may not be a solomon nor do i say he is but this i do say a less selfish human creature human nature never knew unquote. and to this one may add that he is entirely high-minded generous and honorable miss flight's crazes do not prevent her from being full of all womanly sympathies here i think lies the charm these characters had for dickens as he was fond of showing a soul of goodness in the ill-favored and uncouth so he liked to make men feel that even in a disordered intellect all kindly virtues might find a home and a happy one m ten may call this horrible if he likes i think myself it would be possible to find a better adjective dickens was at work on dombey and son during the latter part of the year eighteen forty six and the whole of 1847 and the early part of 1848. We left him on the 16th of November, in the first of these years, starting from Lausanne for Paris, which he reached on the evening of the 20th. Here he took a house, a preposterous house, according to his own account, with only gleams of reason in it, and visited many theatres, and went very often to the morgue where lie the unowned dead, and had pleasant, friendly intercourse with the notable French authors of the time, alexander dumas the great most prolific of romance writers and scribe of the innumerable plays and the poets lamartine and victor hugo and chateaubriand then in his sad and somewhat morose old age and in paris too with the help of streets and crowded ways he wrote the great number of dombey the number in which little paul dies 
Three months did Dickens spend in the French capital, the incomparable city, and then was back in London, at the old life of hard work, but with even a stronger infusion than before of private theatricals, private theatricals on a grandiose scale that were applauded by the queen herself and took him and his troupe starring about during the next three or four years hither and thither and here and there in london and the provinces splendid strolling forrester calls it and a period of unmixed jollity and enjoyment it seems to have been of course dickens was the life and soul of it all mrs cowden clark one of the few survivors looking back to that happy time says enthusiastically quote, Charles Dickens, beaming in look, alert in manner, radiant with good humor, genial-voiced, gay, the very soul of enjoyment, fun, good taste, and good spirits, admirable in organizing details and suggesting novelty of entertainment, was of all beings the very man for a holiday season. Footnote. Recollections of Writers by Charles and Mary Cowden Clark. End of footnote. The proceeds of the performances were devoted to various objects, but chiefly to an impossible guild of literature and art, which, in the sanguine confidence of its projectors, and especially of Dickens, was to inaugurate a golden age for the author and the artist. But of all this, and of Dickens' speeches at the Leeds Mechanics Institute and the Glasgow Athenaeum in December of 1847, I don't know that I need say very much. The interest of a great writer's life is, after all, mainly in what he writes, and when I have said that Dombey proved to be a pecuniary success, the first six numbers realizing as much as £2,820, I think I may fairly pass on to Dickens' next book, The Haunted Man. This was his Christmas story for 1848, the last and not the worst of his Christmas stories. Both conception and treatment are thoroughly characteristic. Mr. Redlaw, a chemist, brooding over an ancient wrong, comes to the conclusion that it would be better for himself, better for all, if in each of us every memory of the past could be cancelled. A ghostly visitant, born of his own resentment and gloom, gives him the boon he seeks, and enables him to go about the world freezing all recollection in those he meets. And lo, the boon turns out to be a curse. His presence blights those on whom it falls." For with the memory of past wrongs goes the memory of past benefits, of all the mutual kindlinesses of life, and each unit of humanity becomes self-centered and selfish. Two beings alone resist his influence. One, a creature too selfishly nurtured for any of mankind's better recollections, and the other, a woman so good as to resist the spell, and even, finally, to exercise it in Mr. Redlaw's own breast. David Copperfield was published between May 1849 and the autumn of 1850, and marks, I think, the culminating point in Dickens' career as a writer. So far there had been, not perhaps from book to book, but on the whole, decided progress, the gradual attainment of greater ease, and of the power of obtaining results of equal power by simpler means. Beyond this there was, if not absolute declension, for he never wrote anything that could properly be called careless and unworthy of himself, yet at least no advance. Of the interest that attaches to the book from the fact that so many portions are autobiographical, I have already spoken, nor need I go over the ground again. But quite apart from such adventitious attractions, the novel is an admirable one. All the scenes of little David's childhood in the Norfolk home, the Blunderstone rookery, where there were no rooks, are among the most beautiful pictures of childhood in existence. In what sunshine of love does the lad bask with his mother and Peggotty till Mrs. Copperfield contracts her disastrous second marriage with Mr. Murdstone? Then how the scene changes. There come harshness and cruelty, banishment to Mr. Creakle's villainous school, the poor mother's death, the worse banishment to London, and descent into warehouse drudgery the strange, shabby-genteel, happy-go-lucky life with the Micawbers, the flight from intolerable ills in the forlorn hope that David's aunt will take pity on him. Here the scene changes again. Miss Betsy Trotwood, a fine old gnarled piece of womanhood, places the boy at school in Canterbury, where he makes acquaintance with Agnes, the woman whom he marries far, far on in the story, and with her father, Mr. Wickham, a somewhat port-wine-loving lawyer, and with Uriah Heep, the fawning villain of the piece. How David is first articled to a proctor in Doctors' Commons, and then becomes a reporter, and then a successful author, and how he marries his first wife, the childish Dora, who dies, 
and how meanwhile uriah is effecting the general ruin and aspiring to the hand of agnes till his villainies are detected and his machinations defeated by micawber how all this comes about would be a long story to tell but as is usual with dickens there are subsidiary rills of story running into the main stream and by one of these i should like to linger a moment the head boy and a kind of parlor boarder at mr creakle's establishment is one steerforth the spoilt only son of a widow this steerforth david meets again when both are young men and they go down together to yarmouth and there david is the means of making him known to a family of fisher folk he is rich handsome with an indescribable charm according to his friend's testimony and he induces the fisherman's niece the pretty emily to desert her home and the young boat builder to whom she is engaged and to fly to italy now to this story as dickens tells it french criticism objects that he dwells exclusively on the sin and sorrow and sets aside that in which the french novelist would delight viz the mad force and irresistible sway of passion to which english criticism may i think reply that the pity of it the wide working desolation are as essentially part of such an event as the passion and therefore even from an exclusively artistic point of view just as fit subjects for the novelist while david copperfield was in progress dickens started on a new venture he had often before projected a periodical and twice as we have seen once in master humphrey's clock and again as editor of the daily news had attempted quasi-journalism or its reality but now at last he had struck the right vein he had discovered a means of utilizing his popularity and imparting it to a paper without being under the crushing necessity of writing the whole of that paper himself the first number of household words appeared on the thirtieth of march eighteen fifty the preliminary word heralds the paper in thoroughly characteristic fashion and is not unnaturally far more personal in tone than the first leading article of the first number of the daily news though that too be it said in passing bears traces through all its officialism of having come from the same pen footnote as for instance in such expressions as this quote, the stamp on newspapers is not like the stamp on universal medicine bottles which licenses anything however false and monstrous unquote. end of footnote in introducing household words to his new readers dickens speaks feelingly eloquently of his own position as a writer and the responsibilities attached to his popularity and tells of his hope that a future of instruction and amusement and kindly playful fancy may be in store for the paper nor were his happy anticipations belied all that he had promised he gave household words found an entrance into innumerable homes and was everywhere recognized as a friend never did editor more strongly impress his own personality upon his staff the articles were sprightly amusing interesting and instructive too often very instructive but always in an interesting way that was one of the periodical's main features the pill of knowledge was always presented gilt taking household words and all the year round together and for this purpose they may properly be regarded as one in the same paper because the change of name and proprietorship in eighteen fifty nine brought no change in form or character taking them together i say they contain a vast quantity of very pleasant if not very profound reading footnote the last number of household words appeared on the twenty eighth of may eighteen fifty nine and the first of all the year round on the thirtieth of april eighteen fifty nine end of footnote even apart from the stories one can do very much worse than while away an hour now and again in gleaning here and there among their pages among dickens own contributions may be mentioned the child's history of england and lazy tour of two idle apprentices being the record of an excursion made by him in eighteen fifty seven with mr wilkie collins and the uncommercial traveller papers while as to stories hard times appeared in household words and the tale of two cities and great expectations in all the year round and to the christmas numbers he gave some of his best and daintiest work nor were novels and tales by other competent hands wanting here it was that mrs gaskell gave to the world those papers on cranford that are so full of a dainty delicate humour and my lady ludlow and north and south and a dark night's work here too mr wilkie collins wove together his ingenious threads of plot and mystery in the moonstone the woman in white and no name and here also lord lytton published a strange story and charles reed his very hard cash the year eighteen fifty one opened sadly for dickens 
His wife, who had been confined of a daughter in the preceding August, was so seriously unwell that he had to take her to Malvern. His father, to whom, notwithstanding the latter's peculiarities and eccentricities, he was greatly attached, died on the 31st of March, and on the 14th of April his infant daughter died also. In connection with this latter death there occurred an incident of great pathos. Dickens had come up from Malvern on the 14th to take the chair at the dinner on behalf of the theatrical fund, and looking in at Devonshire Terrace on his way, played with the children, as was his wont, and fondled the baby, and then went on to the London Tavern. Footnote. There are one or two slight discrepancies between Forrester's narrative and that of Miss Dickens and Miss Hogarth. The latter are clearly more likely to be right on such a matter. End of footnote. Shortly after he left the house, the child died suddenly. The news was communicated to Forrester, who was also at the dinner, and he decided that it would be better not to tell the poor father till the speech of the evening had been made. So Dickens made his speech, and a brilliant one it was. It is brilliant, even as one reads it now, in the coldness of print, without the glamour of the speaker's voice and presence, and yet brilliant with an undertone of sadness, which the recent death of the speaker's father would fully explain. And Forrester, who knew of the yet later blow impending on his friend, had to sit by and listen as that dear friend, all unconscious of the dread application of the words, spoke of the actor having, quote, sometimes to come from scenes of sickness, of suffering, I even of death itself, to play his part, unquote, and then went on to tell how, quote, all of us in our spheres have as often to do violence to our feelings and to hide our hearts in fighting this great battle of life, and in discharging our duties and responsibilities." Unquote. In this same year, 1851, Dickens left the house in Devonshire Terrace, now grown too small for his enlarging household, and after a long sojourn at Broadstairs, moved into Tavistock House in Tavistock Square. Here, Bleak House was begun at the end of November, the first number being published in the ensuing March. It is a fine work of art, unquestionably, a very fine work of art, the canvas all crowded with living figures, and yet the main lines of the composition well-ordered and harmonious. Two threads of interest run through the story, one following the career of Lady Dedlock, and the other tracing the influence of a great chancery suit on the victims enmeshed in its toils. From the first, these two threads are distinct and yet happily interwoven. Let us take Lady Dedlock's thread first. She is the wife of Sir Lester Dedlock, whose, quote, family is as old as the hills and a great deal more respectable, unquote. and she is still very beautiful, though no longer in the bloom of youth, and she is cold and haughty of manner, as a woman of highest fashion sometimes may be. But in her past there is an ugly hidden secret, and a girl of sweetest disposition walks her kindly course through the story, who might call Lady Dedlock mother. This secret, or perhaps rather the fact that there is a secret at all, she reveals in a moment of surprise to the family lawyer, and she lays herself still further open to his suspicions by going, disguised in her maid's clothes, to the poor graveyard where her former lover lies buried. The lawyer worms the whole story out, and, just as he is going to reveal it, is murdered by the French maid aforesaid. But the murder comes too late to save my lady, nay, adds to her difficulties. She flies in anticipation of the disclosure of her secret, and is found dead at the graveyard gate. To such end has the sin of her youth led her. So once again has Dickens dwelt, not on the passionate side of wrongful love, but on its sorrow. Now take the other thread, the chancery suit, Jarndyce versus Jarndyce, a suit held in awful reverence by the profession, as a monument of chancery practice, a suit seemingly interminable, till, after long, long years of wrangling and litigation, the fortuitous discovery of a will settles it all, with the result that the whole estate has been swallowed up in the costs. And how about the litigants? How about poor Richard Carstone and his wife, whom we see in the opening of the story, in all the heyday and happiness of their youth, strolling down to the court? They are its wards, and wondering sadly over the headache and heartache of it all, and then saying gleefully, quote, at all events, chancery will work none of its bad influence on us, unquote. None of its bad influence on us, poor lad whose life is wasted and character impaired in following the mirage of the suit, and who is killed by the mockery of its end. Thus do the two intertwined stories run, 
But apart from these, though all in place and keeping, and helping on the general development, there is a whole profusion of noticeable characters. In enumerating them, however baldly, one scarcely knows where to begin. The lawyer group, clerks and all, is excellent. Dickens' early experiences stood him in good stead here. Excellent, too, are those studies in the ways of impecuniosity and practical shiftlessness. Harold Skimpole, the airy, irresponsible, light-hearted Epicurean, with his pretty tastes and dilettante accomplishments, and Mrs. Jellyby, the philanthropist, whose eyes see nothing nearer than Boreobulaga on the banks of the far Niger, and never dwell to any purpose on the utter discomfort of the home of her husband and children. Characters of this kind no one ever delineated better than Dickens. That Lee Hunt, the poet and essayist who had sat for the portrait of Skimpole, was not altogether flattered by the likeness, is comprehensible enough, and in truth it is unfair, both to painter and model, that we should take such portraits too seriously. Lander, who sat for the thunderous and kindly Boythorn, had more reason to be satisfied. Besides these, one may mention Joe the Outcast and Mr. Turveydrop, the beau of the School of the Regency. How horrified he would have been at the juxtaposition. And George, the keeper of the rifle gallery, a fine soldierly figure. And Mr. Bucket, the detective, though Dickens had a tendency to idealize the abilities of the police force. As to Sir Lester Dedlock, I think he is, on the whole, mine author's best study of the aristocracy, a direction in which Dickens' forte did not lie, for Sir Lester is a gentleman, and receives the terrible blow that falls upon him in a spirit at once chivalrous and human. What between Bleak House, Household Words, and The Child's History of England, Dickens, in the spring of 1853, was overworked and ill. Brighton failed to restore him, and he took his family over to Boulogne in June, occupying there a house belonging to a certain Monsieur de Beaucourt. Town, dwelling, and landlord all suited him exactly. Boulogne he declared to be admirable for its picturesqueness in buildings and life, and equal in some respects to Naples itself. The dwelling, quote, a doll's house of many rooms, unquote, embowered in roses and with a terraced garden, was a place after his own heart. While as to the landlord, he was wonderful. Dickens never tires of extolling his virtues, his generosity, his kindness, his anxiety to please, his pride in the property. All the pleasant, delicate, quaint traits in the man's character are irradiated as if with French sunshine in his tenant's description. It is a dainty little picture and painted with the kindliest of brushes. Poor Beaucourt, he was inconsolable when he and Dickens finally parted three years afterwards. For twice again did the latter occupy a house, but not this same house, on the property. Many were the tears that he shed, and even the garden, the loved garden, went forlorn and unweeded. But that was in 1856. The parting was not so final and terrible in the October of 1853, when Dickens, having finished Bleak House, started with Mr. Wilkie Collins and Augustus Egg, the artist, for a holiday tour in Switzerland and Italy. End of chapter 9 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 10 of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marziaus this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. On his return to England, just after the Christmas of 1853, Dickens gave his first public readings. He had, as we have seen, read The Chimes some nine years before to a select few among his literary friends, and at Lausanne he had similarly read portions of Dombey and Son. But the three readings given at Birmingham on the 27th, 29th, and 30th December, 1853, were in every sense public entertainments, and, except that the proceeds were devoted entirely to the local institute, differed in no way from the famous readings by which he afterwards realized what may almost be called a fortune. The idea of coming before the world in this new character had long been in his mind, as early as 1846, after the private reading at Lausanne, he had written to Forster, quote, I was thinking the other day that in these days of lecturings and readings, a great deal of money might possibly be made, if it were not, in Fredig, by one's having readings of one's own books. I think it would take immensely. What do you say? Unquote. Forster said then, and said consistently throughout, that he held the thing to be in Fredig and unworthy of Dickens' position. 
and in this I think one may venture to assert that Forster was wrong. There can surely be no reason why a popular writer, who happens also to be an excellent elocutionist, should not afford general pleasure by giving sound to his prose and a voice to his imaginary characters. Nor is it opposed to the fitness of things that he should be paid for his skill. If, however, one goes further in Dickens' case and asks whether the readings did not involve too great an expenditure of time, energy, and, as we shall see, ultimately of life, and whether he would not, in the highest sense, have been better employed over his books, why, then the question becomes more difficult of solution. But after all, each man must answer such questions for himself. Dickens may have felt, as the years began to tell, that he required the excitement of the readings for mental stimulus, and that he would not even have written as much as he did without them. Be that as it may, the success at Birmingham, where a sum of from 400 to 500 pounds was realized, the requests that poured in upon him to read at other places, the invariably renewed success whenever he did so, the clear evidence that a large sum was to be realized if he determined to come forward on his own account, all must have contributed to scatter Forster's objections to the winds. On the 29th of April, 1858, at St. Martin's Hall in London, he started his career as a paid public reader, and he continued to read, with shorter or longer periods of intermission, till his death. But into the story of his professional tours, it is not my intention just now to enter. I shall only stay to say a few words about the character and quality of his readings. That they were a success can readily be accounted for. The mere desire to see and hear Dickens, the great Dickens, the novelist who was more than popular, who is the object of real personal affection on the part of the English-speaking race, this would have drawn a crowd at any time. But Dickens was not the man to rely upon such sources of attraction any more than an actress who is really an actress will consent to rely exclusively on her good looks. Whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. Such as we have seen was one of the governing principles of his life, and he read very well. Of nervousness there was no trace in his composition. To someone who asked him whether he ever felt any shyness as a speaker, he answered, Quote, not in the least. The first time I took the chair at a public dinner, I felt as much confidence as if I had done the thing a hundred times. Unquote. This, of course, helped him much as a reader, and gave him full command over all his gifts. But the gifts were also assiduously cultivated. He labored, one might almost say, agonized, to make himself a master of the art. Mr. Dolby, who acted as his manager during the tours undertaken from 1866 to 1870, tells us that before producing Dr. Marigold, he not only gave a kind of semi-public rehearsal, but had rehearsed it to himself considerably over 200 times. Writing to Forster, Dickens says, quote, You have no idea how I have worked at them, the readings. I have tested all the serious passion in them by everything I know, made the humorous points much more humorous, corrected my utterance of certain words. I learnt Dombey like the rest, and did it to myself often twice a day, with exactly the same pains as at night, over and over and over again." Unquote. The results justified the care and effort bestowed. There are, speaking generally, two schools of readers, those who dramatize what they read, and those who read simply, audibly, with every attention to emphasis and point, but with no effort to do more than slightly indicate differences of personage or character. To the latter school Thackeray belonged. He read so as to be perfectly heard and perfectly understood, and so that the innate beauty of his literary style might have full effect. Dickens read quite differently. He read not as a writer to whom style is everything, but as an actor throwing himself into the world he wished to bring before his hearers. He was so careless indeed of pure literature in this particular matter that he altered his books for the readings, eliminating much of the narrative and emphasizing the dialogue. He was preeminently the dramatic reader. Carlyle, who had been dragged to Hanover Rooms to, quote, the complete upsetting, as he says, of my evening habitudes and spiritual composure, was yet constrained to declare, Dickens does it capitally, such as it is, acts better than any Macready in the world, a whole tragic, comic, heroic theater visible, performing under one hat, and keeping us laughing, in a sorry way, some of us thought, the whole night. 
He is a good creature, too, and makes fifty or sixty pounds by each of these readings. Unquote. A whole theatre. That is just the right expression minted for us by the great coiner of phrases. Dickens, by mere play of voice, for the gestures were comparatively sober, placed before you on his imaginary stage the men and women he had created. There Dr. Marigold pattered his cheapjack phrases, and Mrs. Gamp and Betsy Prigg, with throats rendered husky by much gin, had their memorable quarrel, and Sergeant Buzzfuzz bamboozled that stupid jury, and Boots at the Swan told his pretty tale of child elopement, and Fagin, in his hoarse Jew whisper, urged Bill Sykes to his last foul deed of murder. I me, in the great hush of the past, there are tones of the reader's voice that still linger in my ears. I seem to hear once more the agonized quick utterance of poor Nancy as she pleads for life, and the dread stillness after the ruffian's cruel blows have fallen on her upturned face. Again comes back to me the break in Bob Cratchit's voice as he speaks of the death of Tiny Tim. As of old, I listened to poor little Chops the dwarf declaring, very piteously, that his, quote, fashionable friends don't use him well and put him on the mantelpiece when he refuses to have in more champagne wine and lock him in the sideboard when he won't give up his property, unquote. And I see, yes, I declare I see, as I saw when Dickens was reading, such was the illusion of voice and gesture, that dying flame of Scrooge's fire, which leapt up when Marley's ghost came in and then fell again. Nor can I forbear to mention, among these reminiscences, that there is also a passage in one of Thackeray's lectures that is still in my ears as on the evening when I heard it. It is a passage in which he spoke of the love that children had for the works of his more popular rival, and told how his own children would come to him and ask, quote, why don't you write books like Mr. Dickens? Unquote. End of chapter 10. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 11 of Life of Charles Dickens by Frank Marzials. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chancery had occupied a prominent place in Bleak House. Philosophical radicalism occupied the same kind of position in hard times, which was commenced in the number of household words for the 1st of April, 1854. The book, when afterwards published in a complete form, bore a dedication to Carlyle, and very fittingly so, for much of its philosophy is his. Dickens, like Kingsley, and like Mr. Ruskin and Mr. Froude, and so many other men of genius and ability, had come under the influence of the old Chelsea sage. Footnote. Dickens did not accept the whole Carlyle creed. He retained a sort of belief in the collective wisdom of the people, which Carlyle certainly did not share. End of footnote. And what are the ideas which hard times is thus intended to popularize? These, that men are not merely intellectual calculating machines with reason and self-interest for motive power, but creatures possessing also affections, feeling, fancy, a whole world of emotions that lie outside the ken of the older school of political economists. Therefore, to imagine that they can live and flourish on facts alone is a fallacy and pernicious, as is also the notion that any human relations can be permanently established on a basis of pure supply and demand. If we add to this an unlimited contempt for Parliament, as a place where the national dustmen are continually stirring the national dust to no purpose at all, why, then, we are pretty well advanced in the philosophy of Carlyle. And how does Dickens illustrate these points? We are at Coketown, a place, as its name implies, of smoke and manufacture. Here lives and flourishes Thomas Gradgrind, quote, a man of realities, a man of facts and calculations, unquote. Not essentially a bad man, but bound in an iron system as in a vice. He brings up his children on knowledge and enlightened self-interest exclusively and the boy becomes a cub and a mean thief, and the girl marries, quite without love, a certain blustering Mr. Bounderby, and is as nearly as possible led astray by the first person who approaches her with the language of gallantry and sentiment. Mr. Bounderby, her husband, is, one may add, a man who, in mere lying bounce, makes out his humble origin to be more humble than it is. On the other side of the picture are Mr. Sleary and his circus troupe, and Sissy Jupe, the daughter of the clown, 
and the almost saintly figures of Stephen Blackpool and Rachel, a working man and a working woman. With these people facts are as naught, and self-interest as dust in the balance. Mr. Sleary has a heart which no brandy and water can harden, and he enables Mr. Gradgrind to send off the wretched cub to America, refusing any guerdon but a glass of his favorite beverage. The circus troupe are kindly, simple, loving folk. Sissy Jupe proves the angel of the Gradgrind household. Stephen is the victim of unjust persecution on the part of his own class, is suspected, by young Gradgrind's machinations, of the theft committed by that young scoundrel, falls into a disused pit as he is coming to vindicate his character, and only lives long enough to forgive his wrongs and clasp in death the hand of Rachel, a hand which in life could not be his, as he had a wife alive who was a drunkard and worse. A marked contrast, is it not? On one side all darkness, and on the other all light. The demons of fact and self-interest opposed to the angels of fancy and unselfishness. A contrast too violent, unquestionably. Exaggeration is the fault of the novel. One may at once allow, for instance, that Rachel and Stephen, though human nature in its infinite capacity may include such characters, are scarcely a typical working woman and working man. But then, neither, heaven be praised, are Coupeau the Sot and Gervais the Drab in Monsieur Zola's drink. And, for my part, I think Rachel and Stephen the better company. Sullen socialism, such is Macaulay's view of the political philosophy of hard times. Quote, entirely right in main drift and purpose, unquote, such is the verdict of Mr. Ruskin. Who shall decide between the two? Or, if a decision be necessary, then I would venture to say yes, entirely right in feeling. Dickens is right in sympathy for those who toil and suffer, right in desire to make their lives more human and beautiful, right in belief that the same human heart beats below all class distinctions. But beyond this, a novelist only, not a philosopher, not fitted to grapple effectively with complex social and political problems, and to solve them to right conclusions. There are some things, unfortunately, which even the best and kindest instincts cannot accomplish. The last chapter of Hard Times appeared in the number of Household Words for the 12th of August, 1854, and the first number of Little Dorrit came out at Christmas, 1855. Between those dates, a great war had waxed and waned. The heart of England had been terribly moved by the story of the sufferings and privations which the army had had to undergo amid the snows of a Russian winter. From the trenches before Sebastopol, the newspaper correspondents had sent terrible accounts of death and disease, and of ills which, as there seemed room for suspicion, might have been prevented by better management. Through long disuse, the army had rusted in its scabbard, and everything seemed to go wrong but the courage of officers and men. A great demand arose for reform in the whole administration of the country. A movement, now much forgotten, though not fruitless at the time, was started for the purpose of making the civil service more efficient and putting John Bull's house in order. Administrative reform, such was the cry of the moment, and Dickens uttered it with the full strength of his lungs. He attended a great meeting held at Drury Lane Theatre on the 27th of June in furtherance of the cause, and made what he declared to be his first political speech. He spoke on the subject again at the dinner of the theatrical fund. He urged on his friends in the press to the attack. He was in the forefront of the battle, and when his next novel, Little Dorrit, appeared, there was the civil service, like a sort of gibbeted punch, executing the strangest antics. But the circumlocution office, where the clerks sit lazily devising all day long how not to do the business of the country, and devote their energies alternately to marmalade and general insolence, the circumlocution office occupies, after all, only a secondary position in the book. The main interest of it circles round the place that had at one time been almost a home to Dickens. Again he drew upon his earlier experiences. We are once more introduced into a debtor's prison. Little Dorrit is the child of the Marshalsea, born and bred within its walls, the sole living thing about the place on which its taint does not fall. Her worthless brother, her sister, her father, who is not only her father but the father of the Marshalsea, the prison blight is on all three. Her father, especially, is a piece of admirable character drawing. Dickens has often been accused of only catching the surface peculiarities of his personages, their outward tricks and obvious habits of speech and of mind. 
such a study as mr dorrit would alone be sufficient to rebut the charge no novelist specially famed for dissecting character to its innermost recesses could exhibit a finer piece of mental analysis we follow the poor weak creature's deterioration from the time when the helpless muddle in his affairs brings him into durance we note how a sneaking pride seems to feed even on the garbage of his degradation we see how little inward change there is in the man himself when there comes a transformation scene in his fortunes and he leaves the marshalsea wealthy and prosperous it is all thoroughly worked out perfect a piece of really great art no wonder that mr clennam pities the child of such a father indeed considering what a really admirable woman she is one only wonders that his pity does not sooner turn to love little dorrit ran its course from december eighteen fifty five to june eighteen fifty seven and within that space of time there occurred two or three incidents in dickens career which should not pass unnoticed at the first of these dates he was in paris where he remained till the middle of may eighteen fifty six greatly feted by the french world of letters and art dining hither and thither now enjoying an arabian nights sort of banquet given by emile de girardin the popular journalist now meeting george sand the great novelist whom he describes as quote, just the sort of woman in appearance whom you might suppose to be the queen's monthly nurse chubby matronly swarthy black-eyed unquote. then studying french art and contrasting it with english art somewhat to the disadvantage of the latter anon superintending the translation of his works into french and working hard at little dorrit and all the while frequenting the paris theatres with great assiduity and admiration meanwhile too on the fourteenth of march eighteen fifty six a friday his lucky day as he considered it he had written a check for the purchase of gad's hill place at which he had so often looked when a little lad living penuriously at chatham the house which it had been the object of his childish ambition to win for his own so had merit proved to be not without its visible prize literally a prize for good conduct he took possession of the house in the following february and turned workmen into it and finished little dorrit there at first the purchase was intended mainly as an investment and he only purposed to spend some portion of his time at gad's hill letting it at other periods and so recouping himself for the interest on the one thousand seven hundred and ninety pounds which it had cost and for the further sums which he expended on improvements but as time went on it became his hobby the love of his advancing years he beautified here and beautified there built a new drawing-room added bedrooms constructed a tunnel under the road erected in the wilderness on the other side of the road a swiss chalet which had been presented to him by fetchter the french english actor and in short indulged in all the thousand and one vagaries of a proprietor who is enamoured of his property the matter seems to have been one of the family jokes and when on the sunday before his death he showed the conservatory to his younger daughter and said quote, well katie now you see positively the last improvement at gad's hill unquote. there was a general laugh but this is far on in the story and very long before the building of the conservatory long indeed before the main other changes had been made the idea of an investment had been abandoned in eighteen sixty he sold tavistock house in london and made gad's hill place his final home even here however i am anticipating for before getting to eighteen sixty there is in dickens history a page which one would willingly turn over if that were possible in silence and sadness but it is not possible no account of his life would be complete and what is of more importance true if it made no mention of his relations with his wife for some time before eighteen fifty eight dickens had been in an overexcited nervous morbid state during earlier manhood his animal spirits and fresh energy had been superb now as the years advanced and especially at this particular time the energy was the same but it was accompanied by something of feverishness and disease he could not be quiet in the autumn of eighteen fifty seven he wrote to forrester quote, i have now no relief but in action i am become incapable of rest i am quite confident i should rust break and die if i spared myself much better to die doing unquote and again a little later quote, if i couldn't walk fast and far i should just explode and perish unquote. it was the foreshadowing of such utterances of these and the constant wanderings to and fro for readings and theatricals and what not that led harriet martineau 
who had known and greatly liked Dickens, to say, after perusing the second volume of his life, quote, I am much struck by his hysterical restlessness. It must have been terribly wearing to his wife, unquote. On the other hand, there can be no manner of doubt that his wife wore him. Quote, why is it, he had said to Forrester in one of the letters from which I have just quoted, that, as with poor David Copperfield, a sense comes always crushing on me now, when I fall into low spirits, as of one happiness I have missed in life, and one friend and companion I have never made, unquote. And again, quote, I find that the skeleton in my domestic closet is becoming a pretty big one, unquote. Then come even sadder confidences, quote, poor Catherine and I are not made for each other, and there is no help for it. It is not only that she makes me uneasy and unhappy, but that I make her so, too, and much more so. She is exactly what you know in the way of being amiable and complying, but we are strangely ill-assorted for the bond there is between us. Her temperament will not go with mine, unquote. And at last, in March 1858, two months before the end, quote, it is not with me a matter of will or trial or sufferance or good humor or making the best of it or making the worst of it any longer. It is all despairingly over, unquote. So, after living together for 20 years, these two went their several ways in May 1858. Dickens allowed to his wife an income of 600 pounds a year, and the eldest son went to live with her. The other children and their aunt, Miss Hogarth, remained with Dickens himself. Scandal has not only a poisonous but a busy tongue, and when a well-known public man and his wife agree to live apart, the Beldame seldom neglects to give her special version of the affair. So it happened here. Some miserable rumor was whispered about to the detriment of Dickens' morals. He was at the time, as we have seen, in an utterly morbid, excited state, sore doubtless with himself and altogether out of mental condition, and the lie stung him almost to madness. He published an article branding it as it deserved in the number of household words for the 12th of June, 1858. So far, his course of action was justifiable. Granted that it was judicious to notice the rumor at all, and to make his private affairs the matter of public comment, then there was nothing in the terms of the article to which objection could be taken. It contained no reflection of any kind on Mrs. Dickens. It was merely an honest man's indignant protest against an anonymous libel which implicated others as well as himself. Whether the publication, however, was judicious is a different matter. Forster thinks not. He holds that Dickens had altogether exaggerated the public importance of the rumor and the extent of its circulation. And this, according to my own recollection, is entirely true. I was a lad at the time, but a great lover of Dickens' works, as most lads then were, and I well remember the feeling of surprise and regret which that article created among us of the general public. At the same time, it is only fair to Dickens to recollect that the lying story was, at least, so far fraught with danger to his reputation, that Mrs. Dickens would seem for a time to have believed it, and further, that Dickens occupied a very peculiar position towards the public, and a position that might well in his own estimation, and even in ours, give singular importance to the general belief in his personal character. This point will bear dwelling upon. Dickens claimed, and claimed truly, that the relation between himself and the public was one of exceptional sympathy and affection. Perhaps an illustration will best show what that kind of relationship was. Thackeray tells of two ladies with whom he had, at different times, discussed the Christmas Carol, and how each had concluded by saying of the author, God bless him. God bless him, that was the sort of feeling towards himself which Dickens had succeeded in producing in most English hearts. He had appealed from the first, and so constantly, to every kind and gentle emotion, had illustrated so often what is good and true in human character, had pleaded the cause of the weak and suffering with such assiduity, had been so scathingly indignant at all wrong, and he had moreover shown such a manly and chivalrous purity in all his utterance with regard to women, that his readers felt for him a kind of personal tenderness, quite distinct from their mere admiration for his genius as a writer. Nor was that feeling based on his books alone. So far as one could learn at the time, no great dissimilarity existed between the author and the man. We all remember Byron's corrosive remark on the sentimentalist Stern, that he, quote, whined over a dead ass and allowed his mother to die of hunger, unquote. But Dickens' feelings were by no means confined to his pen. He was known to be a good father and a good friend, 
and of perfect truth and honesty. The kindly tolerance for the frailties of a father or brother which he admired in Little Dorrit, he was ready to extend to his own father and his own brother. He was most assiduous in the prosecution of his craft as a writer, and yet had time and leisure of heart at command for all kinds of good and charitable work. His private character had so far stood above all floating cloud of suspicion. That Dickens felt an honorable pride in the general affection he inspired can readily be understood. He also felt, even more honorably, its great responsibility. He knew that his books and he himself were a power for good, and he foresaw how greatly his influence would suffer if a suspicion of hypocrisy, the vice at which he had always girded, were to taint his reputation. Here, for instance, in Little Dorrit, the work written in the thick of his home troubles, he had written of Clennam as, quote, a man who had, deep-rooted in his nature, a belief in all the gentle and good things his life had been without, unquote, and had shown how this belief had, quote, saved Clennam still from the whimpering weakness and cruel selfishness of holding that because such a happiness or such a virtue had not come into his little path or worked well for him, therefore it was not in the great scheme but was reducible when found in appearance to the basest elements unquote. a touching utterance if it expressed the real feeling of a writer sorely disappointed and in great trouble but an utterance moving rather to contempt if it came from a writer who had transferred his affections from his wife to some other woman i do not wonder therefore that dickens excited and exasperated spoke out though i think it would have been better if he had kept silence but he did other things that were not justifiable. He quarreled with Messrs. Bradbury and Evans, his publishers, because they did not use their influence to get Punch, a periodical in which Dickens had no interest, to publish the personal statement that had appeared in Household Words. And worse, much worse, he wrote a letter which ought never to have been written, detailing the grounds on which he and his wife had separated. This letter, dated the 28th of May, 1858, was addressed to his secretary, Arthur Smith, and was to be shown to anyone interested. Arthur Smith showed it to the London correspondent of the New York Tribune, who naturally caused it to be published in that paper. Then Dickens was horrified. He was a man of far too high and chivalrous feeling not to know that the letter contained statements with regard to his wife's failings which ought never to have been made public. He knew as well as anyone that a literary man ought not to take the world into his confidence on such a subject. Ever afterwards, he referred to the letter as his violated letter. But in truth, the wrong went deeper than the publication. The letter should never have been written, certainly never sent to Arthur Smith for general perusal. Dickens' only excuse is the fact that he was clearly not himself at the time, and that he never fell into a like error again. It is, however, sad to notice how entirely his wife seems to have passed out of his affection. The reference to her in his will is almost unkind, and when death was on him, she seems not to have been summoned to his bedside. End of chapter 11. Recording by Colleen McMahon.